Hello, folks. This is Lonzo, the Godfather of West Coast Hip Hop. And I'm sitting here today with a legendary uh, brother from Long Beach. And I don't know if they call him this. I'm going to call him Mr. Day. He's the Godfather of Long Beach. Without him, you don't get no Snoop. You don't get no Warren G. You don't get no Nate Dog. You don't get no, no, no Dog Pound. My man is the owner of VIP Records, a good friend of mine. We go way back, folks. None other than Kelvin Anderson. What's up, Mr. Anderson? Oh, I can't call it. Good morning, my brother. How you doing today? Man, I'm doing fantastic, Doc. I'm doing fantastic. You know, um, every time I talk to you, now, you and I have been, been partners, friends forever. But every time I talk to you, I hear another story about another Long Beach legend that you had something to do with. And I find listening to you is more interesting than listening to myself about talking about me. So, uh, you, you know, I don't know if people know this now, but your whole family has been in the record industry retail for the last God knows how long. Your big brother Cletus on VIP records and uh, you took, you had the one in, in Long Beach. Uh, you told me a story one time about how a young man named Jinx came to you and wanted to buy a drum machine. Tell us that story, will you please? Well, you know, uh, I would say in the early 90s, uh, you know, after being a big part of uh, uh, the Compton movement with uh, N.W.A. and those guys, and the next big movement was uh, uh, the Bay Area with Too Short and E-40 and all those guys and stuff. Uh, we played a big part in that. So uh, I had decided that after seeing my brother Cletus do it, many, many years before working with local talents and stuff like that. He recorded the first thing of Ice T records and stuff. And he used to work with uh Dr. Dre and a lot of those guys and stuff. So after seeing him do it, I said, Well man, you know, and uh gang violence was at an all time high here in Long Beach. So I said, Man, if I uh, could probably open a studio I might get curb some of this violence out here in the streets. So uh I don't know who sent him to me. But uh, Jinx had came to me one day and he said, hey, man, I hear you want to open a recording studio. He said, I can help you. So he actually took me over to his house, took me in the bedroom and showed me a piece of equipment. He asked me, uh, did I know what that was? I said, I have no idea. He said, well, it's called an SP-1200 drum machine. He said, it's virtually a studio. He said, uh, all we need is that and a couple of other pieces, and we can put together a studio. But he told me something interesting and stuff. He said, well, this one right here, he said, it belongs to Drake. And he said, as close as I can get to it is over his shoulder. So now he's telling me he don't even know how to use it, but that's all we need. So uh, he said, you know, if you get that, we can do this. So we actually left his house, went to the guitar center down on Hawthorne Boulevard, I uh, spent $2,500 and bought a new drum machine and gave it to him. And I would say about two or three months later, he came back to me and said, okay, I'm ready. So that's when I made the uh, makeshift uh, studio on the back of VIP Records in the early 90s. And uh, uh, Jinx taught uh, DJ Slice and a couple other guys here how to uh, program and do beats. And uh, it was on and popping, man, every day, all day. Open and close, and kids was coming through, headed to the back room to learn how to uh, uh, rap, be a DJ, do beats, uh, all kind of stuff, man. But uh, it made a big difference and, and kind of changed the whole game uh, here in Long Beach with the youth here. Now, uh, what year was that? Do you remember? I always have to say that was 90, 91, something okay. like that. All right, because yeah. Jinx was with me prior to doing that. Jinx was on my label, Crew Cut, with uh, with uh, Cube and KD under the Stereo Crew. Well, first they yeah under the Stereo Crew, then they became the C CIA. Then we got then um, Dre and them left in about eighty nine ninety formed NWA, and I don't know what happened with that situation. He didn't quite make the transition, so he knew. But he was around enough to know how to get things done. He's always been a hustler. I'm looking to get him on my podcast in the near future also. Oh, yeah. He hung out with me uh, on Saturday. He was up here. So me and Jinx still remain to be very close. Good, good, good. I'm going to have to get his number from him. He uh, caught up with him. Huh? He froze up on me. Go ahead. 
Something happened. You know, I've, they locked up on me for a minute. Definitely part of the family, too. Okay. okay. Go ahead. It's, there you go. We're back. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, I see having a few little glitches this morning. Yeah, that's that Zoom thing. That's all right. It, I, I'll fix it in the editing. Um, now, you say he just came. He was with you Saturday, you say? Yeah, yeah. He was here Saturday. Uh, we hung out. We looking at doing a few things and stuff. Yeah, Jinx still my man. Okay, that's good to hear, man. I'm good to hear. Good to see he's still in the game. Now, how did you and uh, Warren G and Snoop and all them connect? Well, uh, when we opened the studio uh, in the back of the store, uh, like I said, there was a lot of kids back then, man. I mean, everybody from, you know, even Ricky Harris and stuff, rest in peace. You know, the first microphone he ever picked up was in the back of VIP. I can remember Jamie Foxx used to come down a lot, hang out and stuff. He wow. wanted to be a part of one of the clicks back in the day. Okay. But, uh, uh, what had happened was the first artists, serious artists that we work with here at VIP were the artists with the uh, stage name of Radio. And Radio was probably at that time our most talented because he could rap, he could dance, he could sing. He had the unique uh, style of beatboxing, kind of like Biz Marquis. So uh, uh, that was the first artist that we worked with. And then uh, uh, after getting him signed to Interscope, we started working with uh, 213, which uh, consists of Warren, Snoop, and Nate Dogg. So, the radio, right? OK. Oh, what about the radio? Uh, you know what? Man, and I've seen this happen so many times in this industry. You know, I've been, I've been a part of this industry now for 48 years as a retail, in, in retail. And uh, so many times and stuff, when a company go through transition, you can get lost in the shuffle. So when we signed, uh, got radio signed in Interscope, we were signed as like a gangster hardcore rapper. But the flavor of the day during that time was Father MC. Wow. So uh, Interscope spent a whole year transitioning him from what he, what they signed him as to a Father MC type rapper. And so I would say near the end of that first year, here comes Jeff Rowe. Mm. And so uh, right after that, you know, uh, the uh, Chronic Project dropped. So then they, you know, and then of course, Jeff Rowe was running the the, uh, the rap part of the label because, you know, Suge said Interscope don't know how to treat rap. And I don't know, that might have been kind of evident with the handling of Tupac in the early days. Right. But uh, they, uh, Spent a year trying to transition him back to, you know, the person that they signed him as. He got lost in the shuffle and never got momentum and stuff. And uh, a few years later, he actually uh, passed away from I think six or seven. Wow, so, I love that, man. he was he was definitely he's definitely a Long Beach legend. 